Hello and welcome to Insect and Hydroponic Farming in Africa, the new circular food economy. This event is streaming on World Bank Live at live.worldbank.org in both English and French. We're here to discuss the potential of farming insects and hydroponic plants to increase the world's food security in a changing climate. My name is Simon Tulit. I'm a journalist with the BBC World Service specialising in food and farming issues. And so I'm very excited to be moderating this event. If you would like to tweet and share your views, please use the hashtag Future of Food. We're all here to meet a challenge, a big one. It's thought an extra two billion people will be joining us on our planet within the next 30 years, two thirds of them in Africa. And as these populations continue to grow, the world needs to find new ways to provide more nutritious food in a way that doesn't overwhelm our natural resources. A new groundbreaking World Bank report says that farming insects and hydroponic plants could be one of our best solutions. Today's event will begin with some thoughts from Jürgen Fergele, World Bank Vice President for Sustainable Development. We'll then have a presentation by Dorothy Werner, lead author of the report titled Insect and Hydroponic Farming in Africa, a New Circular Food Economy. And to discuss what we've heard and to look to the future, we'll be joined by a fantastic panel of expert guests, including an insect entrepreneur in Kenya and representatives from the UNHCR and the World Bank. Anyway, enough from me, let's get started and welcome Jürgen Fergale to provide a bit of context for today's discussion. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Simon, for the introduction. I'm actually really pleased to be here today to talk about insect farming and hydroponic crops. Uh, I'm quite excited to see the World Bank mobilize new evidence and fresh experience that promotes sustainability and sustainable jobs. And that we urgently need new ideas and new practices to produce more nutritious food in a more sustainable way. You know, as you've seen in the video clip, it's not new to eat insects or to, to consume hydroponic plants, but I think there is new technology, new ways of doing things, new organizational and financial models out there that we, that we absolutely need to explore in order to be able to scale these new technologies. So we need to approaches that address the cycle of warming temperatures, environmental degradation, lowering yields, rising food prices, and increasing pressures on oceans, forests, and lands, the kinds of things we've been observing over the past decades as a result of climate change, as a result of unsustainable farming practices. The cycle is not only bad for the planet, it's also one of the main drivers of rising hunger and malnutrition around the world. I'm sure you have read that according to the UN, around 118 million more people were facing hunger in 2020 than in 2019, partly because of climate shocks, and of course the number was even worse in 2021. But there is a whole suite of climate smart agricultural practices that can green and strengthen the food system, such as reduced tillage, planting trees on ranches and farms, all the things that I'm sure you're, you're familiar with. Alternate wetting and drying and rice systems to get the methane emissions down, more diverse and resilient pasture and integrated pest management, and so on and so on. So these climate smart techniques are out there. Some are no, ready to be um, available for scaling, some are less. And in most cases, actually, these technologies are not expensive. They, because they work with nature instead of against it, and they restore natural synergies that result in, in overall in a much more balanced growth. And so insect farming is one of these climate smart agricultural practices. It produces high quality protein with fewer resources and lower environmental costs than say soya bean or fish meal. And it provides animals with something they already love to eat. It embodies <clears throat> what we mean by green growth and sustainable development applied to food system. The second reason I'm actually quite excited about this topic relates to the poverty reduction and, and, and jobs dimension. The global market for insects as food and animal feed will be worth up to $8 billion by 2030, and that's probably an underestimate. That re represents a 24% annual growth rate over the next decade. Africa, of course, because of its low labor costs and warm climate is very well positioned to benefit. And I think we hear from our panelists a bit more how what this looks like in practice. Africa, Africa already has hydroponic farms and about 850 insect farms. 
And I'm convinced new business will, will be created around innovative and green food technologies. And really, I'm also delighted to see African entrepreneurs leading the way. So I hope today's discussion will spur further thoughts, further conversations, and inspire concrete actions so that insect and hydroponic farming can become an integral part of more sustainable and nutritious food systems. We need innovation for a purpose, and we need a profoundly changed food system globally. And those two can be a part of the solution. With that, thank you. And I look forward to the discussion. Back to you, Simon. Thank you very much, Jürgen. That was Jürgen Fergale, World Bank Vice President for Sustainable Development. Let's hear now in more detail about the potential of insect and hydroponic farming in Africa from the report's lead author, Dorothy Werner. Thank you very much, Simon, and thank you, Jürgen, for your great introduction remark. And this report is still wet, so why don't I move to the PowerPoint that is a little bit drier? So let me share my screen. See if it works this time. What if I told you that it's possible to feed all people in the world with a nutrient rich diet and not drain our planet for forest and biodiversity? And it may even be possible to feed nutritious food to the 10 billion people that live in the world by 2050. You may say it's a dream, but there are untapped potential for producing nutritious food that improve our food system by applying a circular economy concept that will first, not take up more arable land and water, and secondly, increase climate resilience by creating jobs and producing low carbon intensive foods. The African food system cannot feed all people nutritious food right now. Since 2014, per capita food production has been falling. And in 2021, last year, 240 million Africans experienced hunger and more so in countries affected by fragility and conflict, the so-called FCS country, where 29% had insufficient food consumption. With business as usual in Africa, food security will deteriorate for at least a decade. New technologies are part of the solution to increase food security, in addition to better policy. Insect and hydroponic farming are such disruptive technologies. Insect and hydroponic farming are part of the promising menu of solutions to strengthen the food system by increasing the nutrient content in food and decreasing the environmental impact of food and agriculture. Globally, we need to move away from the linear food production model and closer to a circular model that will first strengthen the food system and feed more people nutritious food. Second, create climate resilient livelihoods and incomes from the farm, from the farm and up the value chain. And thirdly, reduce the agricultural footprint on the planet. Insect and hydroponic technologies are comparative cost advantages over front conventional farming when resources are constrained. This is why these technologies can be successful in arid and densely populated areas, for example, in our cities where there's a shortage of arable land and water. There's, this also explains why these technologies are economically advantageous in resource poor communities in Africa. As we increase food security, we could expand the menu of foods that are little resource intention and nutritious. I have had the privilege to share protein rich meals with people across the globe. The Zimbabweans taught me to crunch, to crunch mupama worms. 90% of the Zimbabweans eat incense. Koreans showed me that mealworm can spice up salad and even serve as a key ingredient in desserts. Indians in Shadishkar shared their secret when we cook red weaver ants and enjoyed a meal with ant sauce. Ants are hard to catch, but even harder to prevent from running out of the pan when you cook them. Food connectors, we all like to share a meal. Globally, one to two billion people eat insects that are mostly collected in the wild. And there's a market for insects. 
Insects are delicious and nutritious. They are source of high quality protein. Insects provide nine digestible amino acids, and zinc, and iron, and calcium, all micronutrients that many children in Africa, they like today. Adding only five grams of insect protein a day to the diet can alleviate a person's risk of protein, folate, zinc, and B12 deficiency. There are two key risks with collecting insects in the wild. First, foraged insects are seasonal. For example, the Mopama worm in Southern Africa, we can only collect four months per year. Plus, there's a serious risk of over-harvesting that can reduce the biodiversity and ecosystem services that insects provide. Globally, 40% of insect species are at risk of extinction right now. Secondly, there's an issue with safety in consuming foraged insects. Insects in the wild eat up trees and crops including those that have just been sprayed by pesticides. So insects may contain chemicals dangerous for human health. What if we stopped over-harvesting insects by producing insects instead of collecting them? By farming insects, we will have an all year life supply and we can control what insects eat, so no chemicals enter into the food chain. We can rear insects like we raise other livestock. Clearly, crickets and mealworms can be categorized as the micro livestock, right? But with 20 times fewer greenhouse emissions than livestock per kilo of edible protein. Globally, we have about 2,100 edible insects. And Africans consume roughly 25% of these. But globally, we only farm 20 insect kinds. The team and I collected data in 13 African countries on insect farming and learned there exist around 850 insect farms in these 13 African countries. And every year we see an increase in the number of entrants and insect initiatives in Africa. Barclay Investment Bank estimate that globally the market for insects as human food and animal feed will be worth up to $8 billion by 2030. But my guesstimate is that it will be even larger if Africa takes on the way it seems to be doing and we're gonna learn more about today. Okay, maybe not everyone want to order a meal one burger, but what if animals people eat such as chicken and fish, were fed their favorite foods. Yes, animal feed with insect protein as the main protein source instead of fish meal and soy. Today we feed fish to farm fish. Nearly a third of the global fish camp goes to fish feed. That is unsustainable. Soy needs a lot of arable land to grow. If we reduce soy protein content in animal feed, we could halt the deforestation of the remaining standing tropical forest. Insect farming can provide a lot of protein. So hear me out. In one year, a one acre large black soldier farm can provide more protein than 3,000 acres of land and 130 acres for soybean. That's a lot, right? Black solar fly protein can substitute fish meal and soy. It can even improve the growth performance of animals as we have learned, as we have learned from the surveys in Africa. What does an insect farm look like? Black soldier fly larvae can be produced in a short time in colonies stacked vertically in crates or in pens with high population density. How long does it take to raise a chicken or produce a ton of soybean? That depends. But we know that black soldier fly larvae can be produced in two weeks with no arable land and little water. The demand for animal feed is rapidly increasing in Africa. And so are feed prices that we're hearing right now during the pandemic. In the last decade, in Kenya alone, feed production tripled and reached more than 900,000 tons. 16 insects, 
16 insect species are found in the 13 surveyed African country. Mealworm, crickets, palm wheel, larvae, and black soldier flies are the most common insects. And 90, no, sorry, and 81 percent of the insect farmers that are producing insects in Africa right now produce insects for human consumption. What do insects eat? Insects can be fed organic waste, including household waste, agricultural waste, and food industry waste. The circular production process produces insect and fries, and fries is a biofertilizer. Both can be sold commercially. Insects provide protein and oil that we can feed to people, or to fish and chicken and pigs that serves as food for people. We create jobs along the chain. People buy food, they produce organic waste, which can be served to insects, a circular economy. An insect farmer can contribute to combat climate change and solve waste problem by turning organic waste from a liability into an asset. Insects can help reducing high level of organic waste, including in cities and rural communities. And some of the people that we surveyed in rural Africa told us that the communities since they started producing insects have become much cleaner. This figure shows the representation of the value in the supply chain of edible insects. And it's the farming representation, right? It is like that of other animal protein, but it's new. So not all components are fully developed and implemented, including regulations. The development of insect protein systems and their costs are determined by several factors, depending on the scale of the operation. Costs are mainly determined by labor, as Jürgen mentioned, and also of substrate costs. Small-scale insect farms can exist in parallel with large-scale commercial farms. In Africa right now, these 76% of the existing insect farms, they're small, 20% of medium size, and 4% are large-scale already. Our surveys show that insect farming benefits both youth, women and men, and all ages. In Africa right now, 12% of insect farmers are below 30 years of age, and 22% are over 60 years old. Insects have a ferocious appetite. One square meter of black soldier fly insect farm can consume up to 15 kilos of organic waste per day. Insect converts all sorts of organic waste into protein. Our survey findings reveal that nearly half of insect farmers in Africa use household waste, such as vegetable scraps, etc., to feed insects. Others use food industry waste, such as brewery waste, that are really high, has a high content of protein. In Africa, nearly half of insect farmers say that the income of generation is the main reason they engage in insect farming. In Ghana, Small palm wheel farmer farmer could pay back their initial capital investment in 127 days and earn a revenue of $553 in one year. I am not an expert in industries, but I do know that there's not many other companies who can pay back all the investment in less than half a year. I think that's impressive. In Thailand, a small eight pen cricket farm generate more than $2,000 of net profits from crickets and fries sales per year. In our survey, all farmers experienced an increased consumer demand. And 59% of the insect farmers experienced a higher price than the year before. And 50% experienced a higher price, a 50% higher price than the previous year. That's really impressive. Impressive. In most countries, insect protein is still little competitive, for example, with soybean and fish meal. But in Kenya, the black soda fly larva prices are now below fish meal and soy prices. Very promising from the African industry. What are the potential for insect farming in Africa? We collect, if we collect organic waste and feed it to black soldier fly larvae, that is fed to animals, we can create jobs 
and reduce greenhouse gas emission. We did estimates based on the circular economy model from the top 10 agricultural economies in Africa. And we assumed that we could collect 30% of the agricultural waste for their top five crops. That would generate 200 million tons of waste that we could feed to the black soldier fly larvae and generate two products. As I mentioned, biofertilizers, and we could generate 60 million tons to a value of $19 billion just by using these waste resources. Secondly, we can use black soldier fly larvae protein that we can turn into feed to a value of $2.6 billion. This waste-based black soldier fly protein could meet 40% 14% of the animal protein needs for all fish, chicken, goats, and pig in Africa today. There's social economic benefits with producing insects and feeding them the 30% waste. We could create up to 15 million climbing, resilient, direct, and indirect jobs in Africa. And there's also climate benefits, as I mentioned earlier. Reducing greenhouse gas emissions is key, one key benefit. So if we feed the black soldier fly larvae, the animal feed, as animal feed, we can alleviate up to 86 million tons of CO2 equivalent emission. That is equivalent to taking 18 million cars off the road and that every year. So you see, there's a huge potential for insect farming in Africa. So what are the ways forward for the insect and hydroponic farming technologies? They're actually quite extensive. We propose to organize insect and hydroponic farming in two phases. First, establish a pilot and, in, and also establish the industry, including regulate, regulatory framework, the sector, and then we take them to scale. The report provides ideas on how to do this. So in sum, with insect and hydroponic farming for human food and animal feed, we require no arable land and little water. And we can first improve the food system and come in closer to a circular economy. Secondly, improve the food system and feed more people a nutrient protein rich diet and reduce malnutrition. Third, create climate resilient jobs and income from the farm and up the value chain. Four, contribute to reduce the agricultural footprint on the planet, including from soil degradation, climate change, deforestation, and biodiversity depletion. Fifth, we save hard currency by producing rather than importing protein and fertilizer. I think our colleagues in the Ministry of Finance across Africa would like this. It is possible to feed all people on the planet, but I'm not saying that all humans need to consume insects. Insects can be fed to livestock and fish, but honestly, if you have never eaten a dessert made of bee larvae and white chocolate, you have missed out. Before I finish, I would like to thank my incredible team, my co-authors that have done research and drafted text for this report. The country teams that have helped us collect data that was very hard during COVID. My managers, Holger Cray, Mark, Martin, and Jürgen have supported this journey. I also like to thank the Korean Rural Development Agency and people across the globe that have taught me so much about insects. And finally, I would like to thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Doughty. Um, some of those recipes sounded fantastic. Um, thank you so much. Doughty's presentation and her report explain then that insect farming and hydroponic plants could be invaluable in providing food and animal feed in Africa, as well as in fragile and conflict affected countries. But not only that, they could also, pro they could also improve livelihoods and help protect the environment. Let's turn now then to some of the people leading change in this area and give a very warm welcome indeed to our panel of guests for today. As well as Doughty Werner, we're joined by Martine van Nieuwkop, World Bank Global Director for Agriculture and Global Food Practice. 
Rauf Mazou is also with us. He's Assistant High Commissioner for Operations in the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. That's a mouthful. And last, but by no means least, Talash Hybers, CEO of Insectipro, an insect farm in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, and Talash, let's start with you because you're one of the people actually putting what we've heard into practice. You run one of the 850 or so insect farms in Africa that Jürgen mentioned earlier. First of all then, Talash, how exactly did you get into the business of insect farming? Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending where you are in the world. My name is Talash Hybers, and I run Insectipro, as you just heard. So our story started in 2018. My degree is in agriculture because I believe everybody needs to eat at the end of the day. And when I graduated, I thought I would venture into fish farming. I believe the world is moving towards white meat, and that's one of the livestock of the future. When we were doing the costing of fish farming, we discovered that although living in Kenya, we have cheap land, cheap labor, perfect weather, and plenty of water, fish farming was not as affordable or the cost was still very high. So we had to ask ourselves, why? This is because of feed. So in Kenya, feed makes up 60 to 70% of the cost of production, while in Europe, it's 30 to 50. So more than double is what Africans are spending on feed compared to our counterparts in Europe and Asia. This is because of the protein component. So as Dorte mentioned, the two most common pr protein components are fish meal and soy. The problem with fish meal is that it comes very adulterated. So people are mixing a lot of sand into the bags to reach the kilos. The other problem with fish meal is that it's something that as Kenyans we eat, it's locally called omena, it's a delicacy. The second product is soy. So East Africa is not a soy growing region per se. So we're not producing enough soy for both animal feed and for human consumption. So this means a lot of the product has to be imported. Anything that has to be imported into Kenya comes with an extra cost attached. The second, yeah, also when you consider logistics, not really the best. If you consider things having to leave the port and go into the city, it, it, it's a drama to put it uh, shortly. So we thought, why would we grow protein at the end of the chain when there's a bigger problem in the middle of the chain. So we conducted a small market survey back in October of 2018. Is there enough waste and is there interest in this industry? So is there enough waste? Nairobi produces 2,500 metric tons of organic waste a day, of which around 70% of that is directly accessible to this industry. Is there enough demand? So if you look at the feed millers in Nairobi, there are a total of 250 and they demand around 1 million metric tons of feed is made a year and only 69% of that. So we started to ask ourselves, okay, there is demand and there is market. What is Talash, can, can you hear us? We're just having problems with, with Talash's line there. I'll, I'll just um, jump in now and hopefully we can get Talash back shortly. Um, really interesting stuff she was telling us there about the, the rationale for, um, for setting up her farm. Hopefully we'll get her back in a second. But while, while we re-establish comms with her, perhaps I could bring in Martine Van Newkop, um, who's the World Bank Global Director for Agriculture and Food Global Practice. Um, so Martine, We've heard a lot from, from Doughty's report there about the, the value of, of insect farming. Is the World Bank telling people to eat insects or, or is this more about insects as a feed source for animals? Well, very good. Thanks very much, uh, Simon. And uh, of course, that's a great uh, question. Um, let me start by saying, and I think also Doughty's um, uh, presentation was quite uh, clear on that. I mean, I think the emphasis of this report is on farming insects as in exciting, you know, new business opportunity. I think you also heard um, from our African panelists uh, uh, just now, um, you know, we see there's a source of growth, uh, jobs creation, and while at the same time making a positive impact, you know, on the environment and helping to address the climate uh, emergency. As Dorta said, you know, one to two billion people 
uh, already, uh, you know, consume insects on a regular basis. I mean, collected in the wild. Uh, and as Dorte said, I mean, uh, these traditional supplies increasingly are under stress. Uh, so, so farming insects instead, I mean, will then allow people who already eat insects, I mean, to have access to year-round supply that is safer and has also has higher quality than what's collected in the wild. Uh, without running down, I mean, ecosystems by exhausting the supplies. Um, uh, also, you know, there's a lot of interest and excitement these days, uh, as you might have heard, um, you know, about alternative proteins. I mean, think plant-based meats, I mean, lab-grown meats. Um, and we think that there's an opportunity in this space as well for increased, I mean, consumer demand for insect-based proteins. And of course, this would further then enhance, I mean, the business opportunity of insect farming. And, and then thirdly, of course, the really exciting part of farming insects I mean, is the ability to substitute other forms of animal feed like soybean and fish meal. So I think there are three markets out there, the traditional consumer market, I mean, the new consumers interested in alternative proteins, as well as uh, substituting the animal feed market. Uh, this would make this a very interesting business opportunity, Simon. Thank you so much, Martin. Hopefully we've got Talash back. Talash, you back with us. Um, you, were, you were telling us, filling us in with fascinating detail about why you, you started your insect farm. I suppose the, the gap in, in the market that you saw, the problems you saw there. Um, I wonder if you can tell us in a bit more detail about how it works. I mean, you were talking there about the waste that, that, that you use that goes into production. Um, how does that work? What insects exactly do you farm at Insectipro? How do you farm them? And, and who are your customers? So we farm two insects at Insect Pro. We have the black soldier fly, which is the first insect that we started it. Dorte explained a bit how it works. So we started with the black soldier fly in 2018 with two kilos. Right now we're doing around one metric ton a day. The cool thing or why the black soldier fly is showing so much interest globally is that it, number one, eats waste. So all the organic waste, you're able to upcycle it and then you create circular food systems by providing the last closing gap. It eats waste, you have a high value protein at the end. Its amino acid profile is comparable to fish meal, but you can do it for the price of soy. But then also its poop is very good fertilizer. So right now we're doing a lot of tests with Calro, the Kenyan Agricultural Institute to see how it works, does it work better? So every day we have around 30 metric tons of waste entering our facility from all the markets, but also from all the food processors. And then this we, grind it down into a paste, feed it to our black soldier flies. They eat for 10 days, so they also have a very fast conversion ratio. And then after 10 days, we're able to harvest them, we dry them, and then they go off to either feed millers or directly to farmers. The other insect that we produce is the crickets. So our crickets are for human consumption. Right now we have a bit of a fun time in the office because we're doing flavor development. So we have barbecue flavored crickets, we have salt and vinegar, we have um, cinnamon crunch and salted, I believe. And then from these flavors, we have also developed a porridge. So our porridge is more of our mass market product. So together with Jquat, we take our porridge, or they develop the porridge, we input the crickets. Together with Jquat, they tested it on school age children. It showed to reduce stunting, but also increase weight in these school age children. So this there's a lot of interesting data coming out of this industry right now. It's still a very young industry, so I guess everybody's trying to figure it out. And what was your other question? No, I, I think you've covered it. You, um, you, you mentioned your customers. That was the last thing. Um, so uh, you, you mentioned some of this before, some of the, the problems um, in the sector, I guess. Um, but, but what are the main challenges that you faced in not only setting up, but, but growing your insect farm? Talash, are you there? Okay, we'll we'll wait and see if, if Talash comes back. We're having a, a few problems with, with her connection. Um, while, while we wait for her to come back, I wonder if I could bring in one of our, our other guests um, to, to talk to us and fill us in on some, some more details. As we've heard, one of the 
advantages of, of farming insects and hydroponic plants is that they're well suited for places with limited resources. We heard that in, in Daugherty's report. Limited resources like water, arable land and space. Uh, and those are settings similar to where many refugees reside. Ralph Mazu, these are the places you're, of course, very familiar with um, as Assistant High Commissioner for Operations in the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. But before we talk about how these frontier agricultural technologies could help refugees, I wonder, Ralph, could you set the scene for us and tell us about the food security situation in UNHCR run refugee settings in Africa and, and what you're doing to increase self-reliance there? No, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Simon, and, and greetings to, to everyone. And also appreciation to uh, Jorgen. The cooperation that we're having with the World Bank has really been a, a game changer when it comes to refugee inclusion and, and, and uh, enhancing their, their self-reliance and supporting host communities <clears throat> around the world. Also, thanks to Dorte uh, for first a great presentation and for having initiated this uh, discussion on uh, insect and hydro hydroponic uh, farming in, in Africa. On your question, um, to come back to your question on uh, about the, the food security situation in refugee setting first, there are about 84 million asylum seekers, refugees and internally displaced persons around, uh, around the world, uh, a number which is unfortunately increasing as a result of conflict, uh, persecution, um, and to have a better understanding of the trends, it's important to underline that there were about 25.2 million refugees, asylum seekers and internally displaced persons in uh, 2011. So the number has, has more than tripled in, uh, in 10 years. The food security situation of refugees and other internally displaced people, I would say is precarious. Precarious because they often live in uh, precarious conditions in terms of access to land, employment, access to formal or informal social protection, and simply for not being able to, to plan their, their future. And everything that, that I will say today can, can, be, can, can actually apply to internally displaced uh, people. So in 2021, some 11 million refugees across, 20, uh, across uh, uh, 40 uh, countries benefited from humanitarian support to meet their basic uh, needs. Uh, including food assistance provided in kind or cash in close cooperation with our colleagues from the, the World Food uh, Program. Um, while uh, the overall humanitarian assistance has been increasing due to an even faster increase in number of displaced persons in need of assistance, gaps are widening. We have, for instance, been experiencing serious cuts, 20 to 60 percent in food uh, ration or cash assistance in, uh, in certain locations. Uh, the impact of food costs on refugees as compared to host population uh, in need is proportionately greater because they have limited opportunities uh, to independently meet their, their basic needs due to legal uh, barriers, including restriction on freedom of movement and encampment policies, limited right to work and livelihood opportunities, limited access to arable land. 60% of refugees live in countries where they have restricted uh, rights to access land for agriculture and limited access to uh, financial services. For instance, acute chronic and micronutrient malnutrition remains uh, above emergency threshold and is a serious and is a serious public health concern in refugee situation in several countries, including Ethiopia, Chad, Sudan, South Sudan, Niger, and uh, Bangladesh. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has worsened the situation of refugees and other uh, displaced uh, people. Phone surveys conducted by UNHCR and the World Bank in eight countries found that access to food uh, was a common concern for forcibly displaced and host families through, <clears throat> throughout the pandemic. Host households were typically more likely to be able to access food than displaced uh, households in Djibouti, Iraq, uh, Kenya, Uganda, and, uh, and Yemen. Food insecurity drastically increases protection risk for refugees. In Eastern Chad, for instance, as a result of limited food assistance covering less than 50% uh, of needs, uh, 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 limited li uh, livelihood uh, opportunities, and limited access to arable land, acute malnutrition 
has recently been recorded as higher uh, than uh, 19%. Uh, ensuring protection, uh, ensuring protection risk include uh, secondary migration uh, and sexual exploitation among other uh, negative coping strategies. Regarding the second part of your question on what we're doing to increase refugee self-reliance, uh, the first thing is to stress that uh, while 11 million uh, uh, refugees receive humanitarian assistance in 2021, many more are fending for themselves, mainly in urban settings, often working in the informal sector. Uh, they have been greatly impacted by the lockdown measures imposed by uh, governments to fight the spread of the virus. The main response to their needs is actually to push for the formalization of their role in economies through the right to work. Close to 60% of refugees live in countries with restricted access in practice to uh, registering and operating a business and 62% of refugees live in countries with restricted access to formal uh, employment and being able to contribute to social protection schemes would actually allow them uh, access when they uh, need uh, support. The support provided to refugees and IDPs in camps and settlements is not sustainable and uh, often not smart um, if uh, in the long term, if as it is unfortunately often the case, the refugee situation lasts. Exile lasts on average 17 years. So we are expanding opportunities and partnership in line with the, the Global Compact on Refugees, which was adopted by the General Assembly in December 2018, to enhance opportunities to improve sustainable food security, livelihood and income for refugees. And in that, we are collaborating with the World Bank, with WFP, with the FAO, with the private, with the private sector companies, and many others to scale up investments in agriculture and food, and food systems ensuring the inclusion of uh, refugees. So just briefly, Raul, um, where do you see the potential of these technologies in, in increasing the self-reliance of refugees? Does the UNHCR have plans to use insect farming or hydroponic farms in refugee settings in Africa? No, absolutely. Uh, insect farming and hydroponics are, are very exciting opportunities. You've heard from, from uh, from, from Dorte, you've heard from, from, from Talash, and it definitely has uh, a, a potential in refugee context, benefiting both refugees and, and their hosts. And these technologies can create climate resilience and livelihood opportunities, improve nutrition, and address sustainable solutions to environmental challenges, such as waste management, uh, especially in areas where water and land resources are scarce, which is often the case, uh, as you said yourself, in, the, in, in refugee setting. Among the biggest uh, impacts of climate change is water scarcity and uh, all the contamination of uh, water due to floods, droughts and other uh, severe weather conditions. And for, for example, in Malawi, the overcrowded nature of the refugee camp of Nzaleka, which hosts 51,000 people and the limited availability of resources are major constraints for the effective management of uh, solid waste, including organic waste, crop waste, household waste, manure, and uh, organic uh, proce processing waste. At the same time, investment in agricultural uh, development, solar power, irrigation, and food processing have taken place with funding from uh, AFDB and, and Denmark. And demand for soil uh, organic uh, amendments is high, uh, in the refugee hosting areas. So there are, there is a opportunity to develop multi-sectoral solutions by capitalizing on the insect farming, agricultural development and existing uh, organic waste to, to improve livelihoods, nutrition and environmental uh, management. And together with our partners, we are looking for inclusion of refugees in scalable climate sensitive and market oriented agricultural program uh, globally. Agriculture uh, remains one of the most important uh, economic sectors for the continent, employing the majority of the population and accounting for 14% of GDP in Sub-Saharan Africa. And by ensuring uh, refugees have access to such innovative technologies, we can support a large number of households to improve their incomes, health and nutrition, which uh, 
again leads to uh, improved uh, uh, education, uh, dignity, and, and freedom of choice. And a point that was made earlier, agriculture is also, is also a sector which uh, is often led by, uh, by, by women. So in terms of plans, one thing you said, what, what are our plans uh, to use this technology in, in Africa? And as World Bank, as UNHCR, we are joining forces to expand insect farming uh, among refugees and, and host population, at least two locations where insects, as we said earlier, are already used for feed and, and fodder, Zimbabwe and uh, Malawi. And we, uh, uh, we are also uh, planning to eventually expand to, to Kenya. And I understand that earlier this week, uh, our colleagues uh, in Kenya visited Talasha's farm, uh, which she just uh, described to, to us. So these initiatives are taking place uh, in collaboration and partnership with local universities, research institutions, and, uh, and leading researchers. Support is foreseen for 75 refugees and host community farmers uh, in each of the three countries in the, in the initial uh, phase. Several initiatives uh, are already taking place, supported by UNHCR and, and partners to leverage these technologies uh, in refugee setting in Africa and, and other regions. Uh, further investment, skills development and the availability of an enabling environment can help to significantly scale up uh, these initiatives and, and their impacts. To, to conclude, just two examples, Zimbabwe, um, the high cost of imported feed, and you heard Talash uh, talk about that in the context of Kenya, uh, and import limitation for livestock uh, uh, rearing. Uh, uh, in search of a solution to this challenge, UNHCR, World Vision, and the Ministry of Agriculture have initiated a small pilot farm to produce insects for animal feed. Uh, the unit is producing limited quantities using limited resources available. The uh, potential for scale up exists uh, to, to reach refugees and host community uh, who uh, keep livestock uh, but technical support, market research, and additional uh, resources are, are required. In Kenya, the demand for animal feed has increased considerably in uh, recent years, following a, a growing demand for meat uh, in the country. Different initiatives are ongoing, including a cricket farming project in the Kakuma refugee camp by uh, Danish uh, uh, church uh, aid. In the long term, and upon uh, gathering uh, uh, knowledge and data from the three countries, the idea is to scale up the approach and reach markets with feed and food beyond uh, the respective countries and, and region. Back to you, Sam. Thank you so much, Rauf. Um, Talash, I'm going to come back to you now. I think we've we've got you back with us. Um, it's just one of these things with uh, with virtual technology. I'd much rather be all together with you, but um, hopefully we can talk to you again, Talash. Um, you were talking about setting up the farm and some of the challenges you faced. I wanted to pick up on one of the things that Doughty mentioned uh, in her report, which is the, the cost of insect feed, um, sort of going below some of the more traditional feeds that farmers in Kenya uh, might use. You're raising these black soldier flies the prices you, you could charge are, are competitive, are they? I mean, how do they compare to the cost of, for example, soybeans that farmers might otherwise be using? So there's been some very interesting trends in the last year. If you look at fish meal, fish meal has always between been between a dollar to around a dollar sixty in terms of price. So it is a very expensive input, but what it brings to the animals is worth it. Soy always comfortably sat at less than a dollar until last year. Uh, Zimbabwe, which, not Zimbabwe, sorry, Zambia, which is one of the biggest soy growing regions in Eastern Kenya, in Eastern Africa, decided that they were not going to allow any more import exports of soy to other regions. What this did to the price of soy is soy went from a very comfortable around $88 cents to more than 1.3, so $1.30 per kilo. What this did was an immediate full rush in the price of animal feed. For example, dairy meal went from $25 a per 70 kilo bag to around $34 per 70 kilo bag. This is $10 more for exactly the same input. The good thing with the black soldier fly is that the price is very stable. We're able to produce and keep it at around a dollar. So right now it is the most competitive protein in the market. And we think the price will just keep dropping as we achieve economies of scale. This provides stability. And also because it is a local protein alternative, it will always be available as long as there is waste. 
And, and Talash, what I mean, price is, is obviously a key driver for some of your customers. Um, but but is there anything else that you say to them to try and convince them that they should be using your insect feed as opposed to anything else? And do you get any any resistance from some of the farmers? Does it take is it difficult to try and convince them that insects are the way forward? So when we first started, I'm also I'm a visual learner, so I had to see the product in action working before I could believe my own story. So where we are is in Limuru, there's a lot of farmers there and our neighbor keeps pigs and chickens. So in 2018, in December, we asked him if we could take 10 of his pigs and start feed them, feeding them different rations of black soldier flies. So he took aside 10 mil piglets and we started feeding them different rations of black soldier flies. So a control with zero black soldier flies, a normal feed, and then 100% black soldier flies just out of curiosity and see if what we were reading in science and on Google and YouTube matched what was happening on the ground. So after four months, our farmer was keeping track of what was happening. And he was like, okay, Talash, you have to come see these pigs. So, you know, we go there often, but he was like, no, no, you have to come and see these pigs. So he took a normal piglet, I guess, and put it side by side with one of our piglets. And our piglets were a lot, not, I guess they're now pigs. They were a lot longer and they're already gaining weight. So what this did at four and a half months, the piglets that were fed 75% protein, 75% replacement of the traditional protein with black soldier flies, they were ready for market. They were 84 kilos, which is market ready. The ones that were fed the least amount of protein were ready in five and a half months. The reason that this is special is Limuru is very cold. It's actually not ideal for cricket production, but we grow them inside vertically, is that pigs take six to eight months to grow where we are. So we saved him at least half a month of feeding on the lowest end and maybe four months of feeding on the highest end. So he was very happy because this reduced the amount of input that he needed. He could also do an extra cycle per year. But the coolest thing or the best thing that came out of this was because the pigs gained weight first lengthwise and then got fat, they were very lean. Our farmer normally got $180 per pig. He got $350 per pig. So he was very happy and we were very happy because he saw it in action. Last year, we partnered with a lot of fish farmers. So catfish was taking 20 weeks to grow instead of 20, 24 weeks to grow. So four weeks less of feeding for a farmer can mean all the world of difference. So we don't have to actually tell farmers our story. They hear our story from around and then they go searching. Oh, wow. So it sounds like you've got a, a customer for life there, hopefully. Um, and, and just on that point, just briefly, Talash, if, if you would, I mean, what's the impact that you've seen of, of your farm and your insects on, you know, on your farm itself, on, on your workers, on the surrounding communities and, and the customers that you serve? How much of a benefit has it been? So first of all, we're now a team. I just asked, we're a team of 78 people directly and indirectly we've created 250 jobs over the last three years so there are a lot of people involved in this what we see in the greater community is people are starting to understand more about waste and waste doesn't have to be an end step you know you can still get more out of your mango or the plastic can be recycled so we're seeing a bit more circularity built into our systems especially in markets everybody who works for us i say we kind of have like a small cult mentality they really believe in what we're doing. They understand. They also have started to look at products differently. So what else can we get out of, you know, a tomato? What else, what other insect is interesting? So we're also looking at now growing potentially grasshoppers because that's very popular in Uganda, but also has a lot of benefits on the folic acid side. So we're seeing a lot more innovation, not just in our space, but also in policy. We were one of the first companies to undertake such a project meaning that we had to deal a lot with government. Lucky some of the government agencies we worked very closely with, they were very receptive to new ideas. I mean, it was a very big change. For example, KWS, the Kenya Wildlife Service, the only insect you're legally allowed to grow is a butterfly, but that's a regulation from 1980. I was not even born in the 1980s. So now they're looking at all their laws and rules and regulations and seeing how they can change to keep up with the new innovative environment of Kenya. Talash, thank you so much. Talash Hybers. Um, so for the final word, let's just spend a few minutes with uh, Dorothy Werner, the lead agricultural economist at the World Bank. Um, 
Daughty, you developed, prepared and published this study. What, what motivated you? What motivates me in my work in whatever I do really is the millions of children and families that don't have the access to nutritious food that we have, poverty reduction in general. And it became very clear to me when I started my vacation really to travel around countries and visit the, visiting refugees, it became very clear to me that they are probably some of the most food insecure people in the world, like Raoul, he also had mentioned. And also that they have a lot of skills and many of these refugees actually have an agricultural background. So they're just looking for ways to start producing food again. But many countries, they don't have the access to arable land. And some places you can't even put a seed in the ground. So that's why hydroponic and insect farming are two such technologies. It doesn't require arable land and water. And it's actually portable. Small scale technologies are portable so they can take them with them if they decide to go somewhere else. That's what motivates me. And Dorothy, we've spoken a lot about the potential of of these frontier technologies. Um, are there any countries that have successfully established a really prominent and powerful insect farming industry? And if so, how did they do it? Yes, there is example. And I mean example that I believe there is one successful example. And that is South Korea. South Korea, I think, is a global industry leader for insect farming. And it has developed fairly fast in the last few years. And in 2019, they've already established 2,500 2, insect farms that are producing insects for food, feed, medicine, and health products. And this is just in less than a decade, right? They have created public-private partnership. They have trained farmers. They've provided access to finance. They have seriously invested in research and development and also helped develop the market for insect products. And interestingly, some of the research that really caught my eye that is a lot in line with what Talash is mentioning in terms of nutrition, both for people and animals, is that hospital patients that have been consuming mealworm protein as part of their diet recovering from their illness have recovered faster than people that did not have access to this insect diet. So this is in line with, with the health benefit that we've already heard. And that's why I'm so excited about the future and for everybody getting involved in this. And I'm super excited about teaming up with Raul and his team in UNHCR to do these pilots in Malawi, Zimbabwe, and in Kenya. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dorothy, Dorothy Werner. And thanks to all of our panelists uh, for the last hour, Talash Fibers, Ralph Mazu, and Martin Van Newkop. Well, Dorothy mentioned there one of the countries leading the way in insect farming throughout the world. So to end today's event, we have a few words from South Korea. Hello. 농촌지능청장 박병홍입니다. 세계는 지금 코로나19로 힘든 시기를 보내고 있습니다. 아프리카는 기후변화와 코로나19가 맞물려 심각한 식량 위기를 겪고 있습니다. 이러한 상황에서 아프리카 기아 해결을 위한 착수 보고서 발간 행사를 열게 되어 매우 뜻깊게 생각합니다. 2050년이 되면 세계 인구는 90억여 명에 달할 것으로 전망되고 날로 심각해지는 기후변화로 식량 위기를 맞을 우려가 있습니다. 따라서 인류를 먹여 살릴 수 있는 새로운 대체 식량이 필요합니다. 세계는 미래 인류를 위한 유용한 식량 자원으로 곤충에 주목하고 있습니다. 식용 곤충은 단백질의 보고이며 생산 효율이 높아 식량 자원으로서 성장 가능성이 큽니다. 한국은 오래 전부터 곤충의 가치를 파악하고 정부와 민간이 함께 식용 곤충 개발과 육성에 노력해 왔습니다. 그 결과 
10종의 식용건축을 발굴하고 산업화하여 180여 제품을 선보일 수 있었습니다. 이러한 농촌진흥청의 곤충산업 우수기술을 기반으로 월드뱅크가 추진하는 곤충활용 아프리카 분쟁지역 식량문제 해결 프로젝트에 협력할 수 있게 되어 매우 기쁘게 생각합니다. 곤충은 앞으로 인류가 직면하고 있는 식량난을 해결하는 데 중요한 기여를 할 것으로 생각됩니다. 한국농촌진흥청은 K-인셉 기술로 월드뱅크와 함께 기아 문제 해결에 최선을 다할 것을 약속드리겠습니다. 다시 한번 본 행사를 진심으로 축하드립니다. 감사합니다. Many thanks there to Byung Hung Park and also to his team at the Rural Development Administration in South Korea, which supported the development of this World Bank report on insect farming and hydroponics in Africa. Thanks again to all of our speakers and to all of you who tuned in for this event. It'll be available as a replay at live.worldbank.org. And the report is available online if you'd like to know more. Just go to Open Knowledge. Dot worldbank.org and search for it there. That's it from me and all of us here. Have a wonderful day.